Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to episode 27 of Fracking Nightmare. We have some very interesting material to present to you this evening, and some of it I'm sure many people watching this will not have seen before. It's from a researcher in the US who, in my opinion, is one of the world's leading alternative researchers into tectonic activity. And for the last few years, this particular individual has had a particular interest in the impacts of fracking. Now, his interpretation of events is indeed unique, but cannot be dismissed. So we'll be looking at the work of Dutch Sints a little bit later this evening. But first, at the end of last week's show, we saw Officer 666 being arrested by a young sergeant in the Greater Manchester Police who had clearly had a sense of humour removal. Well, I'm pleased to report that uh, all charges were dropped and the Crown Prosecution Service felt that it would not be able to uphold a conviction of Officer 666 being charged with impersonating a police officer. Well, I'm down here in Devon at the moment at the uh, studios here, and uh, tomorrow morning I should be heading back up to my second home, which, uh, as uh, some of you may recall, is here in East Yorks. There we are, in the East Riding of Yorkshire there, beautiful part of the country, the Yorkshire Wolds, and you see in the uh, green shaded area above the River Humber, the two well sites at Crawberry, just outside the beautiful old walled city of Beverly, with uh, a wonderful minster. And uh, a bit further to the east, the site at West Newton, which is literally almost in the middle of nowhere. But it's beautiful, beautiful countryside, and of course, uh, Rathlin Energy are determined to frack it. Although they have been visiting locals, telling them that not only are they not going to frack, but Rathlin Energy has nothing at all whatsoever to do with the fact that their property prices are plunging and they can't even sell them. But the camps at uh, both Crawberry Hill and West Newton were blessed with a special visitor this week. And uh, here's, the, um, here's the group outside the uh, entrance at... Um, uh, Crawberry Hill. Uh, here's the, another shot of the, the camp. It's fast growing now. It's probably up to about 20 odd tents, has permanent residences of about a dozen people. But in the evening, it's up to uh, 30 odd. And at weekends, up to 50. Obviously, we appreciate that uh, it's very difficult for people to get there during the day. But the support of the local community is increasing at a phenomenal rate. Well, such is the interest in Crawberry Hill that uh, Officer 666 put in a special appearance here. And here he is at the roadblock established by the Humberside Police. And of course, Humberside Police um, have had a mass sense of humour removal and are refusing to recognise the right to peaceful protest. So they are treating the protection community as pickets under the Trade Union and Labour Relations Act, having stated that they might reconsider if they lose the numerical superiority. Well, Officer 666 came down with um, the view of trying to educate some of uh, his uh, Humberside colleagues um, and share some of the experiences from the Greater Manchester Police. But as you can see here, the uh, Humberside Police officers um, demonstrating the full impact of having had the sense of humour removed. And this picture, I think, speaks a thousand words. Because in the absence of uh, the trucks from Rathlin, then the opportunity was taken to try to share some of the protectors' insights with the local police. And clearly, they had absolutely no idea whatsoever why they were there. Many of them acknowledged that they had literally been called in that morning had had very limited briefing, but the briefing that they had had was that they were coming up against the British equivalent of Al-Qaeda, domestic extremists. 
Well, this, of course, is completely outrageous. And we stated that uh, we wanted to uh, talk to the liaison officers. Well, Officer 666 stepped up to the plate and uh, the following day came down in his liaison role. And uh, he confirmed that he would make every effort to uh, educate his colleagues in the Humberside Police. Officer 666 has had a lobotomy and is now absolutely on board with the protection community and recognises that uh, he actually needs to be on our side of the fence rather than the um, opposing side. Here he is getting rather friendly with one of the uh, protectors at uh, Crawberry Hill. Well, we have to have a bit of a laugh every now and again. Otherwise, it might get a little bit too serious. And of course, it is really serious and it's getting more serious all the time. For those who are tuning in to the program for the first time, a reminder, hopefully this graphic is indelibly printed on the minds of all the regular viewers of Fracking Nightmare. 64% of the UK will be up for grabs within a few weeks. 18%, of course, already licensed. The 18% designated there by the brown shading. The remainder will be available to the, uh, the companies, the unconventional gas companies, within just a few weeks. And David Cameron, of course, is determined to accelerate the agenda to pursue unconventional gas and oil. Well, 64% of the country... I hope that it's all bought up. I hope that all those companies that you've never heard of actually manage to find the funds to buy up the rest of the available territory in the UK. Because at that moment, we have 40 million NIMBYs. 40 million people who will start to realise the magnitude of the threat. The threat to their local community. And... We've been given an insight into the magnitude of that threat recently when David Cameron, of course, not happy that he's getting the message across by offering each community £100,000 if they lay down and invite the unconventional gas industry into their community. So on top of that, he offered 100% of the business rates and 1% of revenue once the gas well comes into full production. Well, unfortunately for David Cameron, fortunately for the sanity of humanity, most local authorities ignored that offer. So David Cameron has decided that he needs to up the ante. And so what was bandied around the media was that communities that embrace the unconventional gas industry will receive up to £800,000. Wow. £800,000. Of course, what he's not telling you, well, not in words of one syllable, is that that's actually made up of £20,000 per well. So a quick bit of mental arithmetic, which of course is something that anybody under the age of about 30 is unable to do because they rely on calculators or computers. But those of us that uh, still are retain the capacity for a little bit of mental agility can quickly recognise that that equates to 40 wells. So what David Cameron is saying is that Embrace this industry and we will surround your community with 40 wells. But we're not going to spell it out in words one syllable. We're just going to tell you you get £800,000. So it's time to wake up and try and smell the methane. But of course you can't because it's odourless. So if, if you are living in an area where the local authority are sufficiently corrupt to consider that £800,000 is about their price then I suggest that you get out and buy a canary because you're going to need it at some point in the not too distant future. 64% of the country. In the US, here's a map of the US showing the shale gas plays in the US. Now in the US, this is a, a country with a population that's um, reportedly in excess of 300 million, the bulk of whom live within 100 miles of the coastline, or within 100 miles of the uh, uh, Canadian border, 
but there's not that many up there. It's desolate. A bit like the UK, according to Lord Howe, the desolate northeast and desolate northwest. Although once you get up there, it's not so desolate. It's absolutely beautiful. But in the US, 15 million people are estimated to live within one mile of a fracked gas well within one mile. And academic studies in some areas have shown that the methane content in the water within the mile of a gas well is significantly higher than the background levels recorded elsewhere. Increasingly, we are seeing cities in the US and communities within the states of the US banning fracking. And there's a number that uh, have done this recently. Here we go in California, Santa Cruz has banned fracking. So this is uh, very significant because California is very much an oil state. They followed LA, which announced that it was banning fracking within the city limits. And that, uh, that was just after Christmas. So a great Christmas present there for the residents of LA. But this is the one that is most significant. And this is the one that should actually make people sit up and take notice because when the twin cities of Dallas and Fort Worth, which are a bit like Birmingham and Coventry, they all merge into one. When the cities of Dallas and Fort Worth, which have built their wealth, their industry on the back of the oil industry, when they ban fracking, and it's not a moratorium, unlike in LA, this is an outright de facto ban on fracking. So that should really tell you something, that this ain't something that you need anywhere near your backyard. Well, the US, of course, has been heavily fracked. Unfortunately, uh, most of these shale plays within the US, let's have another look at that uh, slide there. Most of these shale plays have been exploited now for uh, over a decade uh, in the right up here in the uh, northeast. We have the Marcellus shale, which is the most recent shale play to be developed. And the reason that was left till last is because that is in the most heavily or more heavily densely populated area of the United States. So in the UK, now let's go back to uh, the situation here with 64% of the country under threat. But in the, in the US, they have now reached the point where they have gone beyond self-sufficiency and now have a surplus. Now, the gas price in the US is actually rising, but uh, this is because the gas companies are starting to see that the potential revenues and certainly the profit lies not so much in the US domestic market, but in the overseas market, not least Europe. Now, up until very recently, Europe didn't need U.S. gas. But guess what? Something's happened in the last few months now that gives the U.S. the opportunity to establish a new export market for its excess of shale gas. This is why the Ukraine crisis is being hyped and escalated. What's being reported, of course, in the mainstream media is the usual crock of crap and uh, should not be taken at face value. And the US is desperate to get the EU to implement sac sanctions and stop importing gas from Russia. Now, we're even seeing in the UK media the suggestion that the UK needs to accelerate its rush to extract shale gas so that we are not dependent on any Russian gas. Well, we're not dependent on any Russian gas anyway. Even the Department of Energy admits that. The gas imports that we get come from Norway and from Qatar and a little bit from central mainland Europe. In fact, DEC has estimated that even at the most, we get about 0.4% of our gas from Russia. And that's a guess based on some gas that we might get from Germany might have actually originated from Russia. The reality is that we get a significant chunk of gas from our own reserves in the North Sea, from Norway, which has enormous reserves, and from Qatar. 
which right now has an enormous glut and is desperate to sell more because it's lost its major customer, the USA. So the Ukrainian crisis, coincidentally, has come along just at the right time. Well, amazing, isn't it? Well, in the uh, in the US, of course, um, just to make sure that the Ukrainians are kept in check, Joe Biden's son is put onto the board of the uh, Ukrainian gas company. Well, we think I think we can work out what's going to happen here, can't we? And um, of course, it's a topic that uh, you know. The Americans don't want actually discussed in the mainstream media right now. So just to make sure, of course, every other um, second up on his uh, teleprompter, because, of course, uh, uh, Obama cannot actually think, as we have seen. And anyone who's seen the um, YouTube videos of his teleprompter failing and he's completely lost. So here we don't mention fracking Obama. Well, it's a pity that, uh, well, somebody did actually say that to her Madge. Because in the speech, in the Queen's speech, she was supposedly going to be very, very specific about what her government was going to do in this country regarding fracking. But uh, it was leaked, and I believe that the leak first appeared on a website known as Mumsnet. Now, Mumsnet is the equivalent of the Online Women's Institute, but uh, does seem to have an appeal to a much broader age group. And uh, Mumsnet are amazing allies to the anti-fracking community because more and more people, particularly the women in this country, are beginning to realise the impact that this industry will have on all of our lives if it actually gets the go-ahead. Well, just to make sure that uh, David Cameron knew exactly how a significant chunk of the population felt. Greenpeace stepped up to the plate. And uh, just as Her Madge was uh, about to announce that her government was going to introduce legislation which would allow the mother frackers to drill under your property without advising you and without offering any recompense. Now, this, I believe, is it's going into consultation. But the idea is that anything that is drilled below your property, uh, below a depth of 300 metres, which is about 1,000 feet, you don't need to know anything about. Unfortunately, of course, your insurance company might want to know something about it. Uh, because every insurance company that's been approached to date has stated that they will not cover any damage that is attributed to hydraulic fracturing in your area. So uh, back to um, the slides here of David Cameron's house here. So his home was completely surrounded by this uh, green fencing. And uh, the signs up there, we apologize for any inconvenience caused while we frack under your home. Well, this, this was an excellent uh, publicity stunt. It made it into, I think, all of the uh, uh, mainstream media, with the exception, of course, of the Murdoch press. Um, but uh, nonetheless, hopefully more and more people, particularly in middle England, are now starting to latch on that this is perhaps something that they need to take account of. So while you ponder on that, middle England, we'll take our first break. So where are the gas wells? Number one, Tara Township. Here's the town of Tara. Let's zoom out and find a common radius measurement. So we're looking at about uh, 18 kilometers, so that would put six gas wells within 18 kilometers. So number two, Chinchilla Township. So here's the township of Chinchilla. We zoom out, we get our 18 kilometers again, which gives us about 10 gas wells within the 18 kilometer radius. Now number three, Dolby Township. Okay, so the Dolby Township, let's zoom out, get to our measurement tool, and for Dolby we end up with uh, one gas well within a 19 kilometre radius. 
Number four, the unlucky ones in the gas fields. This is QGC BG Group's Kenya Gas Fields processing plant on the edge of several residential estates and farms. The evaporation ponds alone cover almost five and a half kilometres. So let's put it in perspective. Let's zoom out from the town of Chinchilla and make a comparison. The entire width from town end to end is uh, 3.21 kilometres. The length is about 3.29 kilometres. The evaporation ponds would cover Chinchilla one and a half times. Let's zoom out from one of QGC's gas fields. Yes, the dots are gas wells. Yes, the industry isn't even exporting yet. Go to our measurement tool and we have around a 22 kilometer radius. Now I'll give you an example of just how safe human beings will be throughout Australia with the unconventional gas industry. QGC's Cape Well cluster is in the heart of a residential estate. So Toowoomba, unconventional gas has its eyes seriously fixed on you and your surrounds. So no gas wells within a 32 kilometer radius, but if we go for a flight out to your west, you'll see the multinational giants aren't too far away. We pass Mount Irving, Mount Moriah, West Prairie, Cecil Plains, Grassdale, Cumberilla. Are you enjoying the flight? Bilby, Kogan, Weambilla. I can't see why people are whinging. This should be in everyone's backyard, shouldn't it? Here's QGC's tenements. Origin Energy's tenements. Oh, hang on. They're actually multinational corporations. Do you want this where you live? And ending with miles. And how about a flyover from Cecil Plains to central Queensland? This is beautiful farming country. Unfortunately, those that are fixated on containment of the unconventional gas global giants are delusional. Prime agricultural land represents easier, more accessible drilling. It is not protected. As the government has indicated, it does not have the right to take a landholder's right to negotiate with a gas company away from them, even if they are on prime agricultural land. Zooming out and moving further north now, you can see we've really been asleep at the wheel. Zooming in, the blurred clusters turn into definable spots, each one potentially causing irreversible damage to the country. I just cannot stress enough that a majority of the unconventional gas wells are not yet in production. The true effects will become undeniable upon export. What's the scale of damage over Queensland so far? The gas industry is only in first gear in one state, covering over a thousand kilometres long, over 300 kilometres wide. Some very credible projections put total potential unconventional gas well numbers in excess of 200,000 for Queensland alone. It is not the intent of this video to encourage a defeatist thought process. On the contrary, unconventional gas has been heavily wounded in the eyes of the public. Our window of opportunity still exists. Think national, not not in my backyard. Stop the first export train, the Surat Basin to Gladstone's Curtis Island, and stop the unconventional gas industry in this country. And welcome back to part two of episode 27 of Fracking Nightmare. Now I have shown that animation now a few times over previous episodes because it's very, very important to understand how quickly this industry can become established if it is not monitored. Southern Queensland was frack free up until about six years ago. In that time, five and a half thousand wells have been drilled in southern Queensland in an area the size of the UK. And that animation that you've just watched was uh, produced by David Monk, the son of Brian Monk. And uh, regular viewers will know that I interviewed Brian Monk in episodes two and episodes 18. And in both episodes, he actually broke down when he started discussing the impact that the industry had had on the health of his family, and in particular, his four-year-old grandson. And about three episodes ago, I talked about the Parr family in Texas, who had won an award of $3 million in a jury trial. And again, in Texas, they're very significant this, because the jury upheld their claim 
that the loss of their livelihood through water contamination and soil contamination and the impact on their health as a direct result of air contamination was attributable to the unconventional gas industry. Now, sadly, $3 million is going to disappear in a heartbeat because the likelihood is that the Parr family have minimal medical coverage. And if they need medical attention in Texas, then $3 million is not going to go very far. But this was a landmark ruling and in an oil field state. So it's very important that we learn from the experience of the people in Queensland and closer to home to Queensland is the people of New, uh, New South Wales. And last week we were announcing that the um, Bentley blockade, which is just to the south of the uh, Queensland, New South Wales border, uh, a few miles inland from Byron Bay. You can see Byron Bay over there on the on the coast, somewhere over there. And uh, just inland here, the community of Bentley. And some 2,000 people gathered there and going up to 5,000. And then when the New South Wales government announced that they were intending to send some 700 riot police to deal with the protection community that was assembled at Bentley, then the numbers swelled to 10,000. Well, that got the attention of the New South Wales government. And they decided that it was pretty obvious that Met Gasco had not succeeded in achieving social license. And so Met Gasco had their license withdrawn on the basis that they had not met the criteria of consultation with the local communities. Well, of course, social license means public apathy. And in this ersatz form of democracy that we have here in the UK, democracy absolutely relies on public apathy. Your MPs, your local councillors, your district councillors do not want you involved in their business. They want you to elect them and then go away and watch EastEnders and Coronation Street and just leave them to go about their corrupt business as they carry out the wishes of the corporations. There may be one or two, of course, who try and stand up to the corporations, but they generally are only able to serve one term because there are various reasons to find that they are pulled out of office. Well, this is what the uh, Bentley camp looked like just before the success there. And when you compare this to the sad pictures of the dozen or so people at Crawberry Hill and even less over at West Newton. You know, uh, uh, 10 days ago, I was speaking at the Sunrise Festival uh, just above Chepstow Racecourse, where there were some three, 4,000 people there. Imagine if we could have got all of the people at the Sunrise Festival to go up to Crawberry Hill or to West Newton, we could get this industry shut down in a heartbeat because even the lamestream media wouldn't be able to ignore that. Well, well done, Bentley. You have achieved a tremendous breakthrough. As uh, David Monk said in the, in the animation, Queensland was caught asleep at the wheel. But thanks to the Queensland experience, the people of New South Wales have said, not in my name. And I hope that New South Wales can be kept frack free along with every other state in Australia. But we do have to be very aware of the political machinations. As I said last week, we have now about 335 days to get this abomination shut down in the UK. That's until May the 7th next year the next general election, when unless one of the major parties changes its stance on hydraulic fracturing, whomever walks into number 10 will claim that they were elected on a manifesto that included the exploitation of natural gas, or sorry, not natural gas, unconventional gas, shale gas, and gas from coal bed, coal bed methane. Well, the reality is that the politicians are already starting to realize that there is an enormous groundswell against this industry. Wherever a poll is conducted, the results are almost always the same. 
and it falls 80% against, 20% in favour. That doesn't matter whether it's a poll that's run by the uh, Manchester Evening News or the Yorkshire Evening Post, or people going down uh, the streets, knocking on doors and conducting a door-to-door -door survey. The results almost always follow at 80% against, 20% for. And even those who sit on the fence, when they actually take a look at it, it doesn't take long for them to realize that this isn't something that they want in their backyard. And here is the literal acid test. And I tried this on a close relative recently, and I said, look, here's the deal. Your government wants to offer you 20,000 pounds for every well that you permit to be drilled in your community. So let me bring that a little bit closer to home. I'm going to give you a cup with 15% hydrochloric acid. So the dilution is 15%. What is your price to drink that cup? What price? You have a price. Your government thinks you have a price. The reality is that only somebody who is completely insane will take up that offer. It's totally unacceptable. But that is effectively what your government is trying to do to you, to say, you know, drink this cup and we'll pay you. We'll pay you. And if you don't accept the 800,000, then, you know, watch the numbers uh, increase. But they're already starting to lay out a strategy so that they can convince you that they're not really going to frack in your area. And this is uh, from the Daily Mail a couple of weeks ago. The South's oil and gas boom is a big myth. Now, what is a big myth is this story and this report. Because the reality is all they're trying to do is take the attention away and say, look, look, we know that in the Tory heartland that this isn't a very popular policy. But yeah, we just had to look for it, but we're not going to drill and frack in your area. We're going to target the desolate northeast or the desolate northwest. So please vote us back into office. And once we're back in office, then we'll come frack because there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it for the next five years. Unless, of course, you take to the streets. Well, I'm pleased to say that uh, increasingly people are not falling for all this um, political BS. And uh, here's a picture I took on Saturday evening at the Baptist Church uh, on, uh, in Heathfield in East Sussex. And at Heathfield, we had two events there at the weekend. This is on the Saturday evening, where there was literally standing room only. And uh, there was some 200 or so people in the room. And then the following afternoon, you know, on a beautiful, beautiful Sunday afternoon with temperatures uh, in the um, around 23, 24 degrees, um, and I had an event at the Goward Hall in Heathfield, and I thought, well, this, you know, the weather is so amazing. No one's going to come along and listen to a presentation, an in-depth presentation on fracking. But we had 50 people turn up at the Goward Hall on Sunday afternoon. Now, let's go back to that picture a second from Saturday evening, because the one thing that will strike you there is that there's a very common hair color, gray. And yes, the average age of um, people in the audience was definitely uh, around about retirement age, which in many ways is fantastic because these are people, perhaps even the last generation, that have a fair degree of financial independence and they also have time. And it's actually thanks to a group of uh, uh, local residents there, uh, some of whom were retired, for the flyering for putting out some, uh, I think it was somewhere around about seven or 8,000 flyers around the community that uh, got in these numbers on Saturday evening. Now, this is in East Sussex. East Sussex is very rural. There's only 17 miles of dual carriageway in the uh, entire county. And uh, yet, fortunately, the people of Heathfield, who uh, live in a community that's right at the southeastern tip of the Quadrilla license, and although that license actually expires at the end of July, there's a very good prospect that it's uh, purchased, if not by Quadrilla, then by somebody else. And they are determined to ensure that their community remains frack free. You know, and I am pleased to report that pretty much every night of the week, there are many, many events now taking place around the country which are focusing on raising awareness of this abomination. You know, this is 
a cause that we will win. Politically, the establishment has absolutely no chance. And the smart thing for them to do would be to start developing an exit strategy and to try and save a little bit of face. Because as time goes on, and more and more people realize that this is not something that we can permit in this very crowded country of ours that has limited natural resources, particularly water, then people are going to take to the streets. This is David Cameron's poll tax and some. So if you have a meeting, if you know of a meeting in your area, even if you feel you already know everything there is to know about fracking, and I know many of you watching this program do, it's wonderful to stand at the roadside, you know, listening to the other protectors at Crawberry Hill or going along to meetings and listening to people who have educated themselves, who brought themselves up to speed and can speak very eloquently and explain why it is that this abomination has no place in our country. Well, I'm going to, for the last part of the program, introduce you to the work of a wonderful researcher by the name of Dutch Sintz. Now, the establishment, of course, demonize him as a crank or worse, which means that his work is definitely worth looking at. Now, a couple of years ago, some of you may recall that there was a couple of earthquakes in Italy, which actually resulted in the deaths of some 15 people. Now, Dutch Sintz who specializes in looking at tectonic activity around the planet and, and looking at unusual tectonic activity, latched on to something about those earthquakes that I think is worth sharing. I'm not suggesting for one moment that Dutch Sintz is correct. I don't think Dutch Sintz himself would be so arrogant as to say he's absolutely nailed it. But what he's putting forward is a hypothesis that is certainly worthy of consideration. And what is interesting, of course, is that this hypothesis has never been voiced in the mainstream media. So take a look at this. Dutch Sense here, 5.08 p.m. Central Time on Tuesday, May 29th, 2012. And I'm going to show you guys something here. I am just, I've had it. I've had it, okay? Here we go. Uh, let's go ahead and pull these coordinates. Six miles deep. I want you guys to go ahead and start doing this yourselves. This is international outrage, okay? And what I'm getting at here is that the earthquake in Italy is fracking. And 15 people are dead not counting the people that died last time. Same freaking spot. Now I got a message for the people, the freaking oil companies of this world, is that you gotta stop killing people to get energy. All right, here's the fracking operation right here. Two lakes, multiple apparatuses, apparati, and let's just go ahead and look on down here on the street level view just to prove in case you're doubting or you're skeptical or you're in denial still. Frickin' 15 people are dead. You want to deny that? Look at this. Here's the frickin' operation. They've got the pipes here. They've got the storage tanks. At some point, you people are just going to have to start getting a little pissed about this stuff. I'm not here to be your voice piece. I'm not here to be your, your mouth spokesperson. This is a fracking operation. They've got the pipes. They've got the tanks. They've got oil tankers down here, trucks that hold the oil or natural gas, whatever they're pumping. Okay, it's some kind of pumping drilling operation. Fifteen people are dead in Europe on top of all the other places around the world. We've got geologists in straight up denial, denying it, freaking lying. And I'm here trying to report what's going on. I want to take you guys over to my page and read what one of my viewers, who's not obviously not a normal viewer, had to say. How is it that an earthquake powerful enough to result in the death of people hits and I have to come to Dutch sense to hear about it? Good point. Yes, I, I fully agree with you on that. Which is, why the hell is this going on still? 
Where the freak are our professionals in our country, in our world? Who the hell is in charge? Obviously no one, or if they are, it's some deep, dark cabal. What the freak is going on, people? Wake up! Wake up! Hello! Wake up! Fifteen people just died. 6.0 earthquake happened the exact same spot two weeks ago. USGS saying it's very rare, very strange. What, do they not have access to Google Earth? What, is this some kind of new science that I'm doing here where you take and you click on the coordinates of the earthquake and look them up? I am sorry, people, but there's 15 people dead, and I just found out it's fracking-induced. What the freak is going on, huh? Do I have a right to be pissed? I think I do. Especially since I've been pointing this out for a year now. Why do I have to go look it up? Where is everybody else talking about it? Why aren't you people looking this shit up? I'm not trying to go off on the people that are helping. I'm going off on the people that are just straight up denying or don't bother to look it up. I had to wait two weeks and go look it up myself to find out that it's fracking. No one decided to go look up the 6.0? No one did? Really? Here it is, right here. 6.1, northern Italy. It's within a mile. I figured someone would tell me. I figured someone else would know in Europe that someone else would be on top of that situation. And just in case you're wondering if it's just one, no, there's others. Okay, there's multiple. It's not just one drilling operation, fracking operation going on in northern Italy. It's multiples. They're all around the area here. In Campo Satano, Santo. There you go. Okay, guys? You heard it here first. Fracking. Sixty percent of the English countryside is under threat from fracking, a process which has transformed the landscape in many parts of the United States and Australia, and contaminated the drinking water and air with highly toxic chemicals and gases. One in three hydraulic fracturing was using a carcinogen. So it really is a chemical cocktail that goes into the earth, of which up to 40 percent remains there. The grandchildren were in the bath and they started screaming and everything that was in the water was burnt. The MDs have been instructed not to report any negative health effects that they believe to be associated with living over a gas field. There's nothing inherent about the shale gas process that is going to lead to problems. Some of this material was actually taken to a large sewage treatment works, which had no capacity to handle radioactive materials of this kind. 800,000 gallons was dumped into the Manchester Ship Canal. 50 seismic events were recorded during just six fracking treatments. What is the minimum depth that the fracking will fracture? We can't tell you until we drill the exploration. Have you no idea whatsoever? Because it doesn't look like you've done your research. Shale gas for the future, and we will make it happen. We are just numbers, and we are sat on this rich vein of gas, and they will do and say anything to get that gas out of the ground. And welcome back to part three of episode 27, Fracking Nightmare. Now, I firstly want to uh, make it clear that when Dutch introduces his video by saying, I am pissed, that is the American pissed, which means annoyed or angry, and not the British version, which of course means drunk. Dutch since is anything but drunk when he's making his videos. He's asking the questions, and these are the questions that need to be asked. One of the things that I find very disturbing in this country is that the government and the industry and the apologists for the mother frackers will not even acknowledge that there has been any contamination or any health risk or any seismic activ activity as a result of this industry. In fact, they, it would be more honest if they at least acknowledged that there had been these problems and explained how it is that they're going to deal with them. 
But uh, many of you will recall when I met with the iGas management team back in December, and uh, I asked Dave Kerr, uh, one of the senior managers of iGas in the UK, whether or not they had looked at the implications of this industry elsewhere, his response was, Ian, that is not our responsibility. We are dealing with an industry that is sociopathic. We're dealing with an industry that does not have the best interests of the population in any way, shape or form at the heart of its philosophy. It is up to humanity to fight this insanity and step up to the plate and hold the politicians and the industry accountable. Now, Dutch Sints has produced another piece of outstanding work, asking questions that nobody else appears to be asking about the massive mudslide that uh, affected Colorado a couple of weeks ago. Now, this has been loosely attributed to some fracking activity, but Dutch Sints has another slant on it. And I want you to watch this video, and I hope that we're able to get Dutch Sints to come on the show next week and talk us through some of his research and his hypotheses. But take a look at this. Take a look at the work of Dutch Sints. Take a look at his website. Well worth an hour or so of your time. So I'm gonna play out with this video. It runs for just over a quarter of an hour. I'm gonna play out with this video, but watch it and listen carefully to Dutch's observations. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next week. On the western slopes, there was this massive landslide. And this is crazy. Tad is my witness. This is some crazy stuff going on out in Colorado. First things reported was a massive mudslide. All the media, massive mudslide covers the entire area. I said, what are you talking about, massive mudslide? This, is, this area has gotten like one inch of rain in the past couple weeks. It's not, there's not much rainfall there. And if you look at the pictures, of course, you can see there's not much snowfall, snowpack there either. Now, this area flowed out like a lahar and went over hilltops covering things like cement. And the mixture that went down this hillside, came out of the mountaintop basically, is a sandy, rocky mixture. There's no mud in the whole damn thing. There's not even a puddle. And I'm not kidding. You can watch the helicopter flyovers. It's a dr it dried out almost instantly. Now, this got me suspicious, right? I see this. I'm like, what is going on here? So I go on Google Earth and look up the area that CNN is showing. And guess what's there? Fracking operation. The only one around for miles. So I make a post and I say, look, there's fracking operation here. And within minutes across my YouTube and Facebook page, pages, multiple people appeared saying, I'm a local. Well, they said two things. Comments were saying, I'm a local. There's no fracking operation there at all. Dutch sense is misinformation saying that. And another group of people saying, I'm a professional geologist. This is on Facebook. I'm a professional geologist, and there's no fracking going on in the area. Both sets of people. And guess what they both had in common? They were both double-letter name people. And we're talking six or seven of them. Russ Rosenstein and Brandon Branishine and, I mean, just, just double-letter after double-letter, right? Like fictitious characters like Lois Lane, Peter Parker, Mickey Mouse, and Donald Duck. Anyways, they come over denying that there's any frack fracking operation there. Meanwhile, my video, I'm zooming in on the area, and there's this, you know, fresh new frack pads, new compressor station, pipeline station. Now, guess what? When I got challenged on that, it forced me to go look deeper. And this is a message to any oil shill. I know you're listening because I announced that I was going to be talking about this tonight. This is a lesson for you. If you confront someone who's telling the truth on something that they're showing in a satellite picture, you're going to force them to go find more proof to back up their claims. They're not going to back off. Like me, I'm not going to back off. So I went and verified the area and found out that it's called the Colibran Gas System and that it's run by a company called DCP and Occidental, which they basically have fracked the hell out of the area since the 1980s and built new operations there as late as 2011. New ones, new frack wells. 
And the U.S. government, U.S. Department of Energy, partnered up with Exxon Mobil, or Mobil at the time, to do drilling into the area that we're talking about here. Now, they since didn't develop that drill spot that collapsed. They developed all around it. The reason is there's high-pressure liquid sand in the ground. You can go look it up. I've provided links to the USGS and Siri, C-E-R-I, who provides all the seismic data for the Midwest. They've got a whole article on the um, Col- Colbrand, sorry, I keep pronouncing Colbrand, Colbrand, Colorado gas system that is high-pressure liquid sand under the ground that contains a large amount of of leftover oil from the previous oil pumping operations. And they've been bringing in, and they get this, CO2, trucking it in, big trucks of CO2 like you put in a can of soda, and pumping it into the ground. And they call it CO2 sequestration. In other words, storing CO2 in old oil wells. Some genius, and he's a geoengineer, by the way, came up with an idea that you could capture carbon capture in old oil wells and store that carbonation underground like filling up a, a can or a tank of carbon dioxide. Again, the same fizz that you get in your soda. So they've been pumping high amounts of CO2 down into high-pressure liquid sand for God knows how long now. And now at the top of this mountain, at the top of this fracking operation, in between multiple wells, there's an eruption of sand and rock with no lake, no mud, no nothing except for sand and rock. Now, I'm showing this all. You know, I'm just showing it. I'm not even, I'm just like, where is the water, guys? And, and now USGS comes out. They had a town meeting last night. Looks just like Bayou Corn, guys. Just like Bayou Corn. 150 people, 200 people packed into a little room with USGS guys up here saying nothing's going on. Now, c- keep in mind, USGS is the one that's there telling everybody what's happening. Instead of some hydrologist or river flow specialist, it's the USGS there. Okay? And USGS says there's another lake forming up top. Hmm? Right? And they show on the local news, even on CNN, they talk about this, this conference that ha- happened last night at the town hall meeting, I guess is what you should call it. And there's the USGS pointing to the shadow at the top of the mountain. We've all watched the video now. Right, Tat, you've seen it. We've all seen it. The helicopter flyover. They're pointing to that shadow that's up at the top of the mountain that was literally a shadow. You can brighten it up and see right through it. They're saying that's the lake and that there's a new lake forming that could burst out and wash away the entire town. No shit. And they're talking about evacuating the nearby people two miles away near Colbrand. This is, again, on CNN. This is not my own words. This is they've even interviewed a lady who's leaving her farm and and they, they're all packing up at least close by and leaving because of this threat of a new flood. Now, the shills coming over to my page, the oil company paid pet shills commenters, robo commenters, mind you, coming over saying flooding rains are happening here nonstop. Some guy makes a video and he has rain playing in the background, guys. He puts he has rain track. You know, this, like it's not real. He's sitting there. He's playing rain in the background saying, see, don't you see? It's totally raining here. I live here. It's totally raining. Meanwhile, I go look it up. Clear. And all the helicopter footage. They did the flyover. Blue sky, nice and clear. And now the shills came back with, oh, well, it's snowpack melt. That's what it is. When you go look at the, again at the helicopter photos, now they're saying it's a waterfall coming off the top of the mountain that's filling up the pool that's going to wash away the town. It's all a bunch of BS on part of the, clearly what's a fracking operation, high-pressure sand ejected from the ground. Now, everybody's probably asking, how? It's simple, guys. You've got to go back the last two months and, or three months and look at what's happened along the northwestern edge of the craton. First, you have to understand what the craton is. It's the unsubducted plate that sits there undisturbed for the last, well, they say hundreds of millions of years. I debate that on time frame, but... The craton is the the main portion of the U.S. plate that extends from Idaho south through Yellowstone along the western slopes of Colorado down through the south Colorado fracking operations where it makes a hard right-hand turn and goes through Oklahoma and north Texas and then makes a northeastern turn up the east coast. And there's been a series of earthquakes that have happened there over many months now, a swarm in Oklahoma, slight swarm in south Colorado, huge swarm up in Idaho and at Yellowstone. Yellowstone confirmed to have moved 
four inches upwards, raised by four inches, and moved one inch, one and a half inches, southeast since New Year's. And there's been a collapse in now in Washington State, huge landslide collapse, which was preceded by a small earthquake. And as soon as that earthquake was announced in Washington State, they dropped the story and let it go because they were trying to blame it on flooding. But it was a mid-1 to 2.0 earthquake, which happened about 45 minutes to an hour before the collapse in Washington State, followed by a collapse of a butte in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Whole volcanic butte fractured. They said it was flooding. Guess what? We busted their balls for about a week, and they came back out and said, oh, it's just a natural butte fracture. It's not from flooding. And you look at the area. It's dry. There's no water in any parking lots, no mud flows. It's a fracture of, of a butte. Why? Because the whole plate is being displaced from the northwest. And we saw a series of large earthquakes happen off the coast of um, Oregon and British Columbia, Canada. We're talking 7.0 earthquakes off North California, Oregon, and British Columbia. So those are happening at fresh lava fields that the USGS has announced over the last two years that most geologists just didn't even pay attention, but they announced that their sensors were buried off the West Coast by new lava formations. And they announced that the Yellowstone magma chamber and Mount St. Helens magma chamber are recharging with new fresh magma. This is all in the past few months, guys. Then we saw the swarms happen at Yellowstone, and they came out and denied that there was anything going on, said the bison were just running out of the park, blah, 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 all the bison. They got sidetracked on the bison. Meanwhile, the USGS went up and installed a bunch of new monitoring equipment in Idaho. Why? Because the western Idaho, eastern to central Idaho, is the Yellowstone magma chamber's western portion. So the magma chamber from Yellowstone extends all the way across Idaho almost. They verified that via underground radar soundings, ground penetrating radar that went down into the magma and sensed how big the chamber is. And that's where the earthquakes are occurring. So due south of there, we've got Jackson Hole. Due south of Jackson Hole, you've got Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Due south of Glenwood Springs, you've got this collapse. 50 miles to the northeast of the collapse in Colorado, there's Dotsero Volcano. The only volcano in Colorado marked by the USGS is just 50 miles away. The whole craton is in flux, and it's showing at multiple earthquakes in Oklahoma and southern Colorado fracking operations. And so this sand burst, this liquidized sand burst that I believe came out of that fracking operation, and chances are the three guys that were sent up went up There was rumbling reported beforehand, right, guys? They said they were going up to check an irrigation ditch. My best bet is that somebody went up and either opened something or it was just a bad time coincidence that the guys were there when the CO2 liquid sand explosion happened out of the fracking operation. Why did it happen at the fracking operation? Because we all understand. Let me let me explain it like this. We all understand a perforation on a cardboard edge. So if you bend a piece of cardboard normally, it would bend here and there. But if you have a perforation along that edge, it bends there when you put force upon either side. The same thing could be said for a fracking operation. A fracking operation are a, a series of deep wells that have either been drilled or fractured out. And they go deep down into the Earth's crust, up to 10,000 feet, according to the one report that I read. Just for Colbrand alone, they're drilling down to about two miles, two and a half, three miles. Okay? So they drilled a well to 10,000 feet almost, beyond 10,000 feet. So that is a weak point. That acts just like what a volcanic tube would act like in a currently active volcano, only instead of it being filled with lava, it's filled with liquid sand. And if you put pressure on that and force all of that up, it's going to come out just like squeezing on a, a boil or something. I mean, to, to don't mean to be disgusting, but that's what it would be like. It would come up and fracture out and come out at the weakest point in the surface. And that's what I believe happened in Colorado. And the denial, the amount of shills, the amount of oil company f- cronies that came over to my page let me know I was on the right track right from the start. There's no way they're going to pounce on me like that right off the bat unless I'm 100% correct on it being a fracking connection. Now, I called Nine News in Colorado. You guys may know I lived out in Denver for several years. 
Okay, I've got an NBC somewhat connection. They've interviewed me here in St. Louis and covered a few of my stories. So I called Nine News in Colorado to let them know that fracking was indeed at the location. And all the areas that they're zooming in on, mainstream media is conveniently leaving out all the oil and frack wells right there. And the guy on the phone was polite and nice. And he's like, who are you? And and do you have a post on this? Do you have pictures? And I gave him my information. And he's like, oh, oh, okay. Okay. And he got quiet and he basically hung up on me. They don't want people to know. And guess who showed up out in Colorado yesterday, right? So the collapse happens. uh, All this bad publicity on fracking happens. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce sends their head guy out to Colorado, out to Denver, to teach local companies, local gas and oil companies, how to deal with online attacks. (laughs) How to deal with online attacks. Okay, so last night, I would be interested to see if anybody has footage of this town hall meeting that was held. The number of deniers who came over saying they lived in the area and that there was no fracking going on at all, that to me tells me that it may be a situation where locals own some of the wells there, and they're not going to want to admit it, and the government's not going to want to admit it. But there it is. It it came out like a, a shaken up can of soda. And they're doing CO2 at the area with high-pressure sands. What more can I say? Okay, so that happened pretty much all week long. That's kind of like the news that that I've been dealing with all week is either the earthquakes or um, the fracking operations producing these weird results now. Earthquake swarms, uh, collapses, sand geysers, plumes. We have a series of plumes that have happened over the last several months. Again, trace back to frack well flare-offs. People were trying to say those were farmers burning, burning their fields. <laughs> what? No, we traced each one back. It's back to an oil well that's doing a flare-off, which is even worse than just a volcanic event. At least that's natural. I mean, it doesn't, oh, these, you know, and again, this all goes back to abolishing the corporation. Everything that I just bitched about here, the oil company involvement with the government, well, those days would be over. The oil company would be on record as to how much they have to donate to the government on the fundraiser that they have to raise. We need to cut this stuff out. We're destroying the planet. Everybody debated me for years. Dutch Sense doesn't know what he's talking about fracking. There's no fracking earthquake connection. No professional has ever confirmed fracking is causing earthquakes, Dutch Sense. Shut up. Come on. And now USGS comes out. American Geophysical Union comes out. They all come out and confirm it. Two years too late and beyond the damage that already occurred at multiple locations. Those grandmas. Remember that chimney that fell in on the woman? Oh, maybe. Oh, that's right. You guys don't remember the chimney that fell on the woman. Not you guys, but the skeptics who were saying that there was no damage being caused by man there's a lady with a bloody forehead 70 years old where a chimney fell in her house off a fracking earthquake three minutes to break okay and here i am i get worked up how about all the people that died over in italy guys hmm remember that everybody was in denial then that was 2012 6.0 earthquake struck north italy at that fracking operation you had 15 people killed you willing to revisit that one everyone all the skeptics now that the USGS and American Geophysical Union have confirmed everything that we were talking about before. Anyways, this becomes frustrating for me because of the amount of denial. Tat, you get this with 1871. People just don't want to hear it. You know, they, 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 they're like, I can't do anything about it. What am I supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to say something. You're supposed to say something to the people that own the wells. Say something. To the people that go out on July 5th and 6th, You see them out spending money on July 5th and 6th? Say something to them. You don't have to be rude or ignorant. Just let them know. Sometimes just letting somebody know is the step in the right direction. Guarantee you some of those locals heard about the fracking connection. And they're not believing the USGS toolbox who's standing up there pointing to a lake that doesn't exist. Where's the footage, man? Where's the pictures? There's a lake up there. There's a helicopter flying over. It's completely dry. What the hell's going on? Any ideas, Tat? I mean, really, I mean, what, what kind of, what, why are we willing to put up with abuse? We, went, we talked about this two weeks ago. 
This is just like dealing with somebody who's on drugs. Why do we put up with abuse? Because we settle for something. We don't want to rock the boat in our families or in our lives or at work. And it leads to disaster. A problem not confronted is a problem that grows. It's just that simple. We all know in real life, do not neglect the problems in your real life because they will grow into something that's unmanageable. And the same thing's happening with our country, with our environment, with our world, and it all leads back to greed. Corporate greed. That's right. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil.